anyone with lungs can get lung cancer. These people are fighting. It makes you want to fight that much harder. She said, I don't want to die because I did nothing. There is still hope. And we believe there's an answer for everyone if you look far enough. I'm Carla Hill, and welcome to Hope is Here. Lung cancer doesn't respect life's plans. Emily Bennett Taylor knows that better than anyone else. At 28 years of age, she was newly married to her soulmate, Miles, and soon they were planning on a family of their own. But lung cancer had another path for Emily. When I was diagnosed, um, we were 28. We were newlyweds. We'd been we married for a little less than two years, and we had decided that we were going to start a family really soon. Um, we were looking to buy a house and kind of just make our way into that next stage of life. The world crashed down. I think Miles always says it best when he says, you know, it's like we had to push pause on our life. I'm Emily Bennett Taylor, I'm stage four lung cancer survivor. And I'm Miles Taylor and I'm her husband. When she was uh, first diagnosed, that night we got back and I found her in the shower and she was crying in the shower and uh, I just think it really hit her and we kind of held each other and she was in the shower and she said right then, she goes, this disease is not going to beat me. It's not going to take any moment from me. It was, it was awful. <laughs> She's amazing. And I wasn't going to let it beat me. I remember at the very beginning telling Miles, well, this is gonna be a really tough, you know, next six months, year, however long it takes. And he looked at me and he said, no, we're still gonna enjoy every day. And we still made sure we laughed every day and held each other and enjoyed life. It could have been the darkest period in our lives and I don't remember it as that. I mean, it was not a picnic and it's nothing I would ever wanna do again, but we were able to live life and still be happy and still enjoy each other. And I think that that was really important. That was what got me out of bed every day. Her attitude has been unbelievable, unbelievable. You appreciate every moment so much. With her, I mean, I, I think I could uh, love her anymore, but uh, <laughs> there's definitely a whole new level. Yeah, it's, it's been an incredible experience. Yeah. It's still what you didn't have to go through, but yeah. it's, <laughs> it's been, there is, a, there is a reward. There is a silver lining. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Joining us is Emily Bennett Taylor and her husband, Miles. Welcome to Hope is Here. Let's start at the beginning. First of all, how are you? <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We're doing really well. Thank you. It really is a pleasure to have you here. It was such a wonderful journey to read about you in Bonnie Adario's book, The Living Room. Um, so let us start from the beginning because it's such a wonderful journey. You knew, Emily, that something was wrong. The doctor told you it was asthma, but there was a fateful occurrence that changed the course of your life. Tell us about that. We had a, a friend of ours who had been to a, an event for um, a foundation called Jill's Legacy, and it was in memory of Jill Costello, who had been a um, coxswain for the crew team at Cal Berkeley. And when she was 21, she was diagnosed with lung cancer. And unfortunately, her treatments did not work, and at, at the age of 22, she passed. Mm -hmm. So her friends and family created this foundation, and our friends had, were telling us her story. Um, and it just kind of really hit home. I was a college athlete as well, um, a relatively healthy person. I was, you know, 26 or seven or eight at the time when I heard her story um, and it just stuck in my mind. So when I started experiencing symptoms of lung cancer, a cough and a wheeze, um, it was thankfully in my mind to kind of push my doctors to maybe run tests further sooner than, um, than they maybe would have normally. You must have been in disbelief. You are young, healthy, a non-smoker. What does that say about lung cancer mm -hmm. that maybe our audience doesn't know about? It says that anyone with lungs can get lung cancer. It is an organ 
just like any other organ, your kidney, your liver, um, we all have them. And unfortunately, that means that we are at somewhat of a risk of, of developing lung cancer. This is just a disease that humans get and we need to treat everyone with humanity. Thank you for sharing that, Emily. I want to get to your husband, Miles, who is sitting there right next to you, loving you up. I just love to see that. Miles, you became yes. like a ninja <laughs> warrior when it came to the research <laughs> of lung cancer. No, really. I mean, the story is incredible. You left no stone unturned. Can you talk about what you delved right into when you started to think about your wife and lung cancer? The goal is to keep her as much removed as possible. Uh, once I went online and saw that the dire outcome, you know, 1% survival rate um, for stage four diagnosis, um, I obviously didn't want her to be aware of that. It was really just motivated by selfishness that I didn't want to lose my wife, so. <laughs> Well, pathetic, sorry. <laughs> oh, well, Miles, tell me um, about the research yeah. you did. The but oh, you all, you're so precious. Thank you for sharing that. And I realize this is so emotional, but yeah. um, I want you to let our audience know you really delved deep and found some Japanese research. Can you go into a little bit more about that? Late at night when she would go to bed, I kind of just start you know, doing you know, page six Google searches and searching for anything, you know, survival cases. And unfortunately, there wasn't really any cases to pull off of. But there was some research that we found that going on um, uh, in Japan where surgeons were doing full resections of the lung and neighboring organs that were, um, you know, infected as well with, with the uh, disease. And the survival rates, although they weren't, um, you know, much higher, they were still going in the, you know, teens and 20%. And so mm -hmm. for us, that was increasing the you know, likelihood of survival. And so that's where we wanted to go down that direction. And we were being told over and over again by, by doctors at many different institutions that surgery wasn't an option for stage four, which was where I was diagnosed. Um, and there are reasons for that, um, but we were not ready to accept that as our fate. And sometimes it's knowing what not to say that makes a good caregiver. Would you say that that is what got you through it, Emily? I mean, I full on walked into my diagnosis appointment with my doctor and she said stage four and I didn't know that much about cancer. And I, I that didn't mean any difference to me if she had said stage one, two or three. And that's because Miles sheltered me um, from a lot of that. and. I think having a caregiver who does that um, for you and can take a lot of that burden on, mm -hmm. I mean, that's invaluable. I, I, I will forever be grateful for that. You walked into doctor's offices with this research from Japan. <laughs> How long did it take until you found someone that would listen to you in terms of this being a, a lifesaver for you, Emily, or Miles, take this? Yeah, um, obviously it was outside the box thinking and it went against typical treatment um she was definitely being pushed towards more of a palliative care treatment mm -hmm. and unfortunately it wasn't a path that people were really willing to go down uh, but fortunately her college roommate uh, heard a surgeon while at a conference in um on the east coast and she recommended we reach out to a, a specific surgeon named dr raja flores who was doing some innovative treatments for mesothelioma patients mm -hmm. and um that kind of what changed our lives. Initially, we were hoping that she would have a genetic marker so she can get a specific, uh, you know, a chemotherapy pill that she could take. Mm. Unfortunately, Emily was negative for all those genetic markers. So she was going down a traditional chemotherapy path. And, you know, I think she had a 20% chance of having a positive reaction or even rating stable off mm. the chemo initially. But we were told that over time, even if she did have a positive reaction, which she did, that it would eventually, the uh, tumor would adapt to the treatment and eventually start continuing to grow. So we knew we were on a short window and we were very thankful that she had the response she did, but nevertheless, it, we knew that we had to have a plan B. And mm -hmm. so our goal was to get a plan B. We knew it would be pretty radical and pretty aggressive, but with her age and her strength, we were willing to get a little aggressive and, and take a chance. And was that aggressive path surgery? Yes. Yes. Every appointment we went into, Emily would say, can we do this? Can we do surgery now? Can we do, can cut it out of me now every single time? And um, it, no matter how many times she heard no and how many times the surgeon said that wasn't a possibility, 
she was <laughs> undeterred and she uh, she eventually found a path to make it work. Oh my goodness. Well, Miles I'm pretty is stubborn. Yeah, I see that as as we should be when we <laughs> are in the moment yeah. of doing things to save our lives. Um, Miles yeah. is the master researcher and was even, as I mentioned, reading cases from Japan. You had to have the documents translated. Tell us about the journey to finding a doctor here in the States that would perform the surgery on Emily. Or, you know, Emily, what was that journey like for you? Dr. Flores was someone that we had been in communication with since pretty early on. Um, and he said, okay, I can't, now is not a time to do surgery, but send me your scans. And so every time I got a scan, we would have it sent to him and he would review it. Okay, now is not the time. You're having a great response, but now is not the time. This is working. Now is not the time for surgery. And then finally, after my sixth round of chemo, we sent him a scan and it showed that the tumors had been knocked back by about 80% overall mm -hmm. and that, you know, the lining around my lung and things was um, had, had, had gone down a lot. And he thought, okay, now now's the time to do surgery. Um, and I read, Emily, in your chapter in the living room that you would visualize your tumors and all of the things related to your cancer disappearing or being uh, uh, minimized through the chemo. So it looks like you willed this surgery into your life. Would you say so? Miles would do those meditations with me at night and. He would say things like, you know, your, your cells are attacking the cancer cells and go into your brain and make sure it's clean and go into your arms and your legs and like make sure everything is clean and attack all the cells that are not here to further the health of your body. And, you know, I think I, I hope it helped for you as well. I know it helped for me to feel like we had something to do with my health. Yes. You know, I, uh, that has been a uh a theme with all of our guests, this hope and visualization of wellness. I wanted to, you know, ask you, uh, Emily, I saw an interview that after the operation, you needed to know if the cancer was gone and it wasn't detectable. You asked the doctor mm -hmm. and what did the doctor say? The entire time we wanted surgery because we felt like that was the best path towards no evidence of disease, NED, and we always called that NED. And I don't know if that's actually what the medical community calls it or not, but we called it NED. Um, so that was obviously the goal with surgery. And when I was in the ICU after surgery, um, they had removed my entire lung, the pleural lining around my lung, part of the pericardial sac around my heart, my right diaphragm, and some lymph nodes. Um, and Miles said, well, what did Dr. Flores say? He came in right after Dr. Flores had seen me. And uh, he said, well, what did Dr. Flores say? And I said, oh, he said the surgery went well. He goes, well, did he say anything about if you're Ned? And I said, oh, I don't know. And I was out of it. And Miles ran down the hall after Dr. Flores and said, hey, we just wanted to know, like, is she Ned now? She um, Ned? <laughs> and Dr. Flores said, oh. Yeah. He, had, he had no idea what that meant. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, and then Miles explained, oh, we mean NED, no evidence of disease. He goes, oh, yeah, and he came all the way back. Oh, and wow. He, you know, he explained it to me that, yes, I was. I did have no evidence of disease. And Miles found a piece of paper and wrote down NED with the date 2913 on it and pinned that up um, on the TV in my ICU room so that, you know, I could see it from wherever I was in the bed. And that was just, that was a momentous day for us. We still have the piece of paper. Yeah. Yeah. What did you do when you heard that you were finally <laughs> Ned? I love that. What did you do? Um, I did about as much celebration as you can um, 24 hours after having your lung removed and being in the ICU, but we were, just, I mean, we cried. Um, there were a lot of tears um, of really, of just pure joy. <laughs> um, and I think also relief. I heard there was a little dancing. How did you do that with one lung post-surgery? <laughs> <laughs> um, so for my recovery in the hospital, Miles had walked the hallways of the hospital and measured out um, distances. And he's like, okay, today we're going to do 
it was short at first, like a hundred yards. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we would go do that. And it was really important to get up and walk after surgery yes. to kind of just um, keep the fluid out of, your, out of your lungs. So we walked, you know, a hundred feet or a hundred yards and then increased it a little bit more, a little bit more. And every day he'd be like, this is your goal. Okay. This is what we're going to do. And I was, I had this walker thing. And then there was this oxygen tank that I was pulling behind me and there was an IV bag and and I was uh, it was a sight um but he walked with me the whole way and then he would play like music so the pointer sisters jump was my favorite (laughs) and I would walk along with my little walker and and dance you know like this you know not really dancing but it just it motivated me to push a little harder and go a little farther every day Oh, what a wonderful story. I, that's great. Dancing heal, heals the world, that's for sure. I want to go back a little bit uh, before the surgery, knowing you both wanted to have children and that chemo and radiation can destroy those changes. What did you decide to do as a couple before surgery? So um, we did look into our options. We found a, a specialist who worked on fertility with cancer patients in the LA area. Um, got in to see her right away. And we had a couple weeks between my diagnosis and when I had to start treatment. Mm-hmm. So within that time, um, we were able to undergo fertility preservation. And um, at the end of that, we had nine embryos waiting for oh us. Um, and that was a huge motivator. Yeah, it was, I always say that was like our light at the end of the tunnel, you know, and yeah. on those really, really dark days when it was there was no hope and there was um, really nothing to look forward to or I was really in pain or sick. Um, that was what I clung to, um, that, that hope of a future. So many women are mm-hmm. need to hear that message to know that they, they have those options. Emily, where are you now in terms of prognosis and health? There's not really a way to describe the gratitude for life um, that you go through after you've been through something like this. Um, And so, (laughs) I mean, it sounds cheesy, but every day is a gift. And um, even though my life is a bit different, then, I mean, stairs are still hard for me. You know, I I get to the top of a a flight of stairs and I have to take a little, you know, a beat and just kind of let myself breathe and, and rest. There is a lot that is different about my life. I can't go do a hard workout. Um, I can't. Sure, Yeah, but I'm Ned. She's Ned. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That is, I think, that's it. That's... (laughs) That's all that matters. So that, that is all that matters. You know, Emily, you had such support along the way. Tell us about that and how important support and love is critical during the cancer journey before and after treatment. We had a wonderful support network, not just with our family, but you know, a huge group of friends who were checking in on us and not just on me, but on Miles as the caregiver because that's a lot to take on. You know, you're speaking of support and the Bonnie J. Adario Foundation, as well as the GoTo Foundation was incredibly helpful in guiding you in support. What was your relationship like with Bonnie? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Bonnie was like another mother to me. Um, She just, oh God, I'm gonna cry talking about her. Um, When you're diagnosed with something like this, it's so critical um, to speak with people who have been there. Mm -hmm. Um, There are just, support is great, but someone who's actually been there, there's a next level of support there um, that happens and a connection that you can have with people. And we met Bonnie very early on in my diagnosis. My sister-in-law had reached out to her foundation and her daughter called us from her vacation and talked to Miles and my sister-in-law for, you know, over an hour you know, about what tests I needed to get and and what I needed to do in order to have a better outcome. So they have always been a critical and very, um, they've always had a soft spot in our hearts. And um, so we were kind of involved with the foundation. And then about three months after my diagnosis, we went up to San Francisco for a fun run, a 5K with Bonnie's foundation, the Adair Mm -hmm. Lung Cancer Foundation, which is now the go-to foundation for lung cancer. And... um, I will never forget the moment that I, I met Bonnie, you know, somebody said, oh, Bonnie's over here. You need to come over and meet Bonnie. And she turned around and her face just lit up and she opened her arms. She says, there you are. And just gave me this huge hug. And I just, 
like the love and the caring that she had for me and that she has for every patient yes. is just, it's out of this world. And I always, I will always be grateful to Bonnie. She, I always say like, Bonnie came at cancer 110 miles an hour down the road for sure. and she crashed right through it and she had a success story, but instead of just continuing to drive at 110 miles an hour away from her past, she decided to turn around and help other patients that were stuck on the side of the road or who had accidents of our own. So Bonnie never forgot what it was like to be a patient. And I, I hope to live my life like that. I do as much work as I can with patients and with outreach and awareness because Bonnie set an excellent example for me on what it's like to, um, to beat this and kind of the, the debt that we need to repay and pass on to those who are going through it again and going through it now. Oh, incredible. Bonnie talks in the book, The Living Room, that you and her just made an instant connection, and I can see that, that it's such a personal relationship. <laughs> Emily, you have sacrificed and yet grown so much from living with and then surviving cancer. You now have dedicated your life, as you mentioned, to helping those who are newly diagnosed. So tell our audience about that, because it must be difficult sometimes. Yes, um, it's difficult, but um, I remember when I was first diagnosed, Miles had a goal of every day he wanted to find a story on the internet of somebody who had survived like cancer. Um, and he thought, okay, that's going to be great. She'll, she'll read that. It'll give her hope. And there was nothing, right? There was, was one story. One story he was oh my able goodness. to find. Um, so we had a, a blog that we had started to kind of let people know in our friends and family network what was going on. It was too hard to reach out to every single person individually. So the blog was just our way to kind of keep everybody informed. And so today I get contacted through that blog by patients, I would say not a daily basis, but a weekly basis. Um, people who have read various articles on the blog or people who have seen me speaking in, in various capacities and fundraisers or patient outreach. And to me being able to give back in that way and to be that story that I so desperately wanted to hear Yes. earlier on in my diagnosis, to be that for somebody else. Um, I will I will talk to a patient all day long on the phone if they need somebody to talk to. I will answer their emails late at night. Um, I'll text with them whatever they need. Um, not just trying to get them on a good path for you know making sure they've got the right tests and the right treatments and the right doctors, but making sure that, that they know that there's someone there who has been through this experience and who can walk them through it. You work through your blog, you speak with patients, you also speak at conferences. I saw that one video of a dynamic speech where you implore doctors in the medical world in general to do more to bring the survival rate up. There was also an emotional and an unexpected announcement that took everyone by surprise. Let's watch now. As a patient advocate and spokesperson for the ALCF, I see all too often how devastating this disease can be. It can take away life's precious moments. But by being here, all of us are fighting back and getting back those moments. It is because of my aggressive care team that I am able to share that just a few days ago, my husband and I received the news that our surrogate is pregnant. I will be a mother. You persevered, both of you, um, and several years after your diagnosis, you and Miles became complete and achieved a dream you had the day you were married. Miles, what reveal that dream to everyone watching today? Oh, well, we're very fortunate. We had twin baby girls, oh, uh, wow. Hope and Maggie. <laughs> and they're now almost six years old, so they keep us very entertained. <laughs> um, but obviously Hope named after you know, the journey that we went through and Maggie named after her grandmother as well. But there are little, little blessings that we have and we're just so, so very fortunate. We love them to pieces. <laughs> Hugs and kisses to Hope and Maggie. But before we go, from each of you, um, Miles and Emily, and, and doesn't matter who goes first, 
how has your cancer journey, or Miles for you, how has Emily's cancer journey changed you? Um, this is a question for each of you. Wow. Um, I think what amazed me the most was when we, she was first diagnosed, I was so apprehensive to ask for help. Uh, I thought it was, you know, we were dealt a bad hand, but it was our responsibility to deal with it. I didn't want to put our burden on someone else. And, you know, through that blog and through reaching out to uh, our, our family and friends as they were, you know, became more aware of the situation we were in, I was overwhelmed by the response and mm -hmm. the help that we got. And um, it's amazing what people are capable of doing. And I've just learned, yeah, it's okay to raise your hand and ask for help and to, um, what the, the power of a group of people, what they can do. That's what blew my mind. Emily, what about yourself? I try to give others grace when, um, you know, before somebody might've cut me off on the road and I would have been upset. Um, but now I realize, okay, well, you never know what someone else is going through mm -hmm. and you never know what kind of a day they've had. You know, maybe they just got a diagnosis like this. Maybe someone that they love is, is, has a diagnosis of something. When someone does something intentional or unintentional, I just feel like I do my best to realize that everyone has something going on in their lives and you never know what that might be. So give them the grace to, you know, just if they cut you off, they cut you off. It's not a big deal. So I think patience and um, yeah, understanding. Emily, you're someone that never gave up to live your dream. Thank you, Miles and Emily, for showing us the magnitude of hope, true hope, and the power of love. Again, you all are a wonderful example of that. Please take care.